This is Laura London, and you're listening to a special quarantine edition of Speaking of Jung. Joining us for the fourth episode in this series is photographer and author Lenny Foster in St. Augustine, Florida. For over 20 years, Lenny had the good fortune of owning and operating the Living Light Photography Gallery in Taos, New Mexico. His work is on view in prominent institutions throughout New Mexico, including the Harwood Museum of Art, the Albuquerque Museum, and the Hubbard Museum of the American West. His work is also part of permanent collections in the Muhammad Ali Center in Louisville, Kentucky, the Ross Art Museum at Ohio Wesleyan University, and the Snyte Museum of Art at the University of Notre Dame. In addition, he's had the honor of having his work added to many private collections worldwide, including my own. In 2013, he published his first fine art book, Healing Hands, Embodied Spirit and Light. And in the summer of 2016, he published Enchanted Land, a Taos 20-year retrospective. He began 2017 by publishing his first volume of haiku poetry and imagery, inspired by his last month in Taos, while staying at the historic Maple Dodge Lewin House. I'm honored beyond words to have a photo of myself holding Lama Zopa Rinpoche's prayer wheel outside in the snow, shot by Lenny, included in the book. As a new resident of St. Augustine, Florida, Lenny is redefining his unique and spiritual vision. A community with such a rich, deep, and diverse history and culture, coupled with its varied and fascinating architecture, gives him a sense that he will be inspired and creating for quite some time. With the opening of Gallery 144, he plans to further explore and create imagery that inspires. His recent ethereal seascapes and botanical imagery certainly speak to that. Also presently, he is exploring his connection to the life of the Wyatts, the first family of American art. Lenny continues to turn his inspired and unique eye on the history of African American experience locally and document its people's evolution, including places and landmarks of historical significance. I have known Lenny Foster for over 20 years, and I have found him to be one of the most creative, spiritual, and beloved people that I have ever known. This interview is being recorded on Wednesday, June 3rd, 2020, through the magic of Skype. Good afternoon, Laura. Hi. Sorry for all the flubs there. I'm quite nervous today. I'm a bit nervous myself, but that's a good sign. Well, I've actually mentioned you on this podcast several times. And I think the last time being because I had a synchronicity around the number 144. And it was right around the time that you had opened your new gallery. So when we're going to talk about this, you spent over 20 years in Taos, New Mexico. And I wanted to say recently, but it's been a few years now, you relocated to St. Augustine, Florida, and so you moved your gallery and you renamed your gallery, Gallery 144. Would you tell us why you call it that? Well, the address is 144 King Street. And I wanted a new look and feel to the gallery, a uh, more contemporary look and feel. And I thought having a more contemporary name would, would lend itself to this new new look that I wanted to create. Did you have any connection to the number or you just took the number from the address? I, I took the number from the address, but, you know, always there's a there's a, a, a higher reason yeah. <laughs> for things. Mm -hmm. and, and for some, that number 144 is a, a spiritual number. There's a high number. I, I can't recall why at this moment, mm -hmm. but after deciding on the, the name of the gallery and looking that up, and also, maybe it was you that mentioned it, and, and I got a nice letter from a collector in Taos who told me the significance of the number 144 for her and how she felt naming the gallery that was a good thing. Mm -hmm. You know, prior to this, it was the Living Light Gallery in Taos, which was, I think, so fitting for who I am and what I do and what I try to put out. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot to talk about today, but... 
let's start with how you got started as a photographer. Um, I met you, I was trying to remember when it was, and I actually don't know the exact year. <laughs> I think it was in the late 1990s in Taos, New mm. Mexico. Your gallery was on Ledoux Street, the historic Ledoux mm -hmm. Street. Um, and I remember what it looked like on the outside. And the first time I went there, I couldn't get in. It was closed. But you had these Buddhas in the window. And it's this gorgeous adobe building it was in. And that name really struck me, Living Light. So would you tell us about how you wound up in Taos, how you wound up being a photographer, and then we'll go from there. Okay. Oh, great. Um, I don't remember what year it was that I met you, but I, I'm certainly glad that you did meet and, and have remained friends for these almost 20 years. Uh, I went to Chitaos, New Mexico, from the Washington, D.C. area, uh, where I was a sales manager at a Honda dealership. <laughs> of all occupations, <laughs> but it was good for me. Uh, but I decided to uh, pursue photography. I think it was in 1991, and I was new, newly sober. I was think, I think I was five years sober, and I was needing something to do besides work the crazy hours that I was working or attending as many 12 step meetings as I could on a weekly basis and working out. I loved playing racquetball back in those days and would play a lot. But I, there was a void and I needed something. And I remember saying a little prayer, uh, asking God to please send me something. Uh, and shortly after that, I took, uh, a video production class at Montgomery Community College in Maryland. And I was really interested in that and enjoyed that. Uh, and shortly after that, I got the idea. I saw a camera in a pawn shop uh, a few blocks down from the dealership that I was working in. I was intrigued by that. And I thought maybe this is something that I could do. Uh, I had a friend who... Uh, working with me at the dealership in New Cameras, uh, Grandma Camara, I'll never forget him. Uh, he went down and he checked the camera out and he said, it's good to go um, and go buy it. He says, because you need to do something. <laughs> so right. I bought it and, and from the first roll, I was hooked. I used to go to the upper part of the Potomac and uh, they call it the Great Falls. There's a Great Falls, Virginia and Maryland on either side of the river. Uh, I would go hiking in Great Falls. I would go hiking Skyline Drive, uh, tip of the Blue Ridge Parkway. I would go to the Eastern Shore, uh, Maryland. I would go to the Botanical Gardens, the Byzantine Gardens, uh, the National Arboretum, and I would just walk and shoot and eat apples and sit and meditate and pray and, and just be. Um, because one thing that the photography did for me and still does is that when I'm in the process of, I'm not thinking about anything else. Mm -hmm. I am in the moment. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm freed up from anything else uh, and can just breathe and, Take in the beauty, take in the peace, uh, take in the spirit, and, and relax. Uh, so that's how I got started there. And uh, shortly after that, a couple years, less than a couple years, uh, I, I went with a friend to New Mexico and Arizona. Uh, she wanted to do a little road trip to explore the Southwest and and her her goal was to visit Taos and to start at, uh, see if it was possible to start an equine assisted therapy practice in Taos, New mm -hmm. Mexico. Uh, she had been there uh, when she was in her 20s. She had gone through Taos, always uh, vowed to go back and live. Um, so here it is. 
30 years later, she's making a trip out there and wanted some company. So I went out and, uh, and with my new love of photography, we photographed Sedona, the Grand Canyon, the Valley, and then to Taos. And, you know, Taos to me then, uh, and when I left, it was just a dusty little town. Right. <laughs> uh, but it was a wide expanse of sky and the land and the color of the, the blue. It's a, a, a blue I've never seen before. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, that New Mexico uh, blue. Uh, and being able to see 80 miles to the west. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, of course, you know, being at 7,000 feet is much different than, you know, being at sea level. You know, the air is crystal clean and clear and it was just beautiful, and the images that came from that trip. Uh, but when I got back home and, and sharing images with people that I work with, there was a, a great appreciation for them. And uh, people were there was two or three people that were moved to to buy a couple of prints, and so I thought, well, this could be a good thing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I've been in sales most of my adult life, so uh, selling things is not not a hard thing for me to do. So my friend had went out to Taos and and found a piece of land in the house and decided to move uh, shortly after our vacation. Um, And I I thought that was mighty bold and brave. Um, it, It was a couple of months or so after the trip and uh, flipping through an Arizona Highways magazine uh, that I I remembered a time when I was, I don't know, 10 or so, and I had my bedroom covered in pictures of the Southwest. Did you? I forget, I forget this until I'm flipping through this Arizona Highways mm-hmm. magazine, mm-hmm. Uh, and my mother used to bring stacks of them home from work. Her boss, uh, Jack C., used to send her old uh, Arizona Highways magazine, you know, just tear out the pictures, cut out the pictures, and cover my walls with the Southwest. So I'm sitting in my office in the dealership uh, a couple of months after the trip, and I'm looking through the magazine, and this memory comes back, and I was like, oh, shit, I have to move. And I believe it was, I had just bought a new car, a new Honda Prelude that a couple of months after that, I traded the prelude for a truck. Um, so the truck. Three months after that, I'm packing up my belongings and putting the truck on the back of a U-Haul trailer, and I'm driving across country. And not knowing exactly what I'm going to do or how I was going to do it, but knowing that I wanted a, a change from that kind of rat race. Uh, high pressure sales gig, uh, to trying to find a way of life that was more suitable for me mm-hmm. uh, and wanting to somehow incorporate photography into that, uh, not knowing how, but so that's how I ended up in Taos. So. And what year was that? 1993. 93. And you went straight to Taos? Yes. Mm-hmm. What happened? And I after- thought it would be, yeah. I thought I was going for, I, I would stay there for a year or two mm-hmm. and move on to my long time dream of living in the Bay Area. Uh, Cause I always thought the Bay Area was a cool place to be. Mm-hmm. Um, so I thought, yeah, after a year or two in Taos that I would move on. And, uh, you know, I call my time in Taos the long year because year I thought I would that only uh I would only be there that year a year or two ended up being 23 years yeah uh for for, for various reasons things worked out uh sometimes when you get to Taos it's hard to leave (laughs) it is hard to leave yeah it's it's hard for me to leave when I just go there for a week at a time and it New Mm. Mexico is called the land of enchantment and we jokingly refer to it as the land of entrapment because it, it gets you, it hooks you. It is a place unlike any other I have ever been. 
I agree. It, it, it did that for me. It worked for me for many years. And I, I love the, the plays and the, the people especially. Uh, I think it was one of the first times that uh, I really, because it is such a small town, uh, it was really easy to develop community. And so I miss that community uh, to this day. So you kind of set up shop there. You opened your own gallery. And then it, it was there on Ledoux Street for many years. And then you moved to kind of the center of town, right there, smack dab in the middle at the crossroads of the main street that goes through town and Kit Carson. And when you're, when you're heading north on that main street, heading toward Taos Mountain, if you turn right on Kit Carson, immediately on your left is what they called the boardwalk. Yes, it, it really it was. And it's one of the few uh, remaining boardwalks in the Southwest. Oh, I mean, so it's I, a I real boardwalk. Remember. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I can't remember it dated, but it was probably the late. There was a plaque in the window. I don't mm-hmm. know if it was the late 1800s, but it had been there for quite some time. So the Kit Carson Home and Museum is right there, right? Or is it yeah, further a down? Doors down. Couple doors down. Couple doors down. Yeah. And so you moved from Ledoux Street, which again I keep mentioning it because it's it's really this gorgeous little street, and it's where the Harwood Museum is and Inger Jerby's gallery, but it, it's kind of hidden, and you have to know where it is to get there. And when you move to Kit Carson, you're right in the in the center of town. Yes. Uh, the Ledoux Street was actually the second gallery. The first one was on Kesnell, a little small, I don't know if it was 300 square feet, uh, a little space, uh, two rooms. And I, I got that space initially because you know, I was starting to do uh, work for hire, you know, family portraits, uh, small weddings, uh, exterior shots for B&Bs and uh, you know, I was meeting people at the coffee house every morning, and uh, it became apparent that I needed to have a little office where I could meet clients. And and so I got a little space, and I decided to put some work on the wall. And I was there for three plus years. And the Ledoux Street space, which was the old Emil Bistrom studio, he was one of the original uh, Taos. He was a member of, or started the Taos Transcendental Artist Group. Um, and he was a re- really famous guy, and real prolific, uh, prolific work that he did. I, I came across that space on my birthday when I just started thinking about getting a, a bigger space and, and a pl- uh, space that was more visible. Mm-hmm. And I walked down the street and that space was empty. And I was terrified because it was what I dreamt of. (laughs) You know, when your dreams seem possible, tangible, uh, there's, there's, uh, I think, a fright that goes along with that. Sure. Uh, And I was, I was scared to death. One, because it was tripling expenses. It was triple the space, huge space. Right. 15 foot ceiling in the front room, the big north facing artist window. Uh, it was, it became a sanctuary in many respects. Uh, but that leap from going to the small, safe, sheltered space to really expanding uh, was, a, was a huge moment in my life, uh, both my creative life and, and me personally and spiritually, uh, because it forced me to, to throw caution to the wind, to get out of my comfort zone, Mm-hmm. And, and unfortunately, a uh, well-known artist uh, in Taos held my hand uh, uh, and told me the reasons why I should make the move. Uh, you know, I was focusing on, I was just coming from a place of fear, even though I wanted it. Uh, how can it happen? And if I deserved it, and yada, yada, yada if the work was worth it and all of this stuff. Wow. And she assured me that, you know, by honoring myself and honoring the work that 
uh, I will I will achieve what I needed to achieve and people will find me, people will respect the work, it will be presented in a more professional way, in a more professional environment, mm-hmm. and it would lead to my growth as an artist. Mm. And so I took that leap and I was there for eight years and the same, a similar thing happened when it was time to move again to go up to Kit Carson to, to find a, uh, a more accessible place, a more visible place. Right. Um, uh, and again, it was it was expanding to doubling the size of what I had, um, and it was a, it was a big leap. Uh, but what those two moves taught me. Uh, well, the three moves, getting the first gallery, the second, and the third, and, and even moving here, is that uh, when my knees are knocking, it's a sure sign <laughs> that I'm headed in the right direction. I love it when that happens, and I love hearing stories like that, that that's how powerful we can be for each other. And having that happen to me, I feel a responsibility to try to do that for others. Mm. And no matter what someone is trying to do. Mm-hmm. They're trying to be an artist or a writer or a teacher or a doctor or a, um, a, a good store clerk, uh, whatever it is, uh, to, to go for it, uh, to, to try, because it's hard to see what blessings, what beauty is going to come uh, from the point you are in, in the moment. Uh, you have to I think for me, what I found out, I have to take a step forward before I'm afforded the ability to see the path. Well, you've certainly... Before the path can... Yeah. No, no, please. Before the path can uh, 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 reveal itself or unfold, you know, you you have to take that leap. You have to take a step forward and the right situations start to happen. The right people come into your lives. So, mm. Uh, for me, there, I, I, I see the right imagery, the things I'm supposed to see. I can see and I, I make the right connections. And uh, I discover parts of myself that I didn't know existed. You know, I've developed more confidence, more strength, more skill. Uh, but you, you can't do that sitting on the couch. <laughs> right. And you've often been that for me, I have to say. Uh, I've, mm. You've inspired me. I've been telling you that for so long um and you don't have to say much uh you are to me the example of you live it and getting to watch you live your life is what inspires me and so many times when I didn't have any self-confidence just a few words from you changed that for me and you didn't have to say much. Um, and so I want to thank you for that. And I know I've thanked you for that before, but I want to thank you again, because you have continued to be a huge source of inspiration for me for many, many years. And I'd like to talk about your Healing Hands series, because you started that series um, by making and what you did with it photographing people's hands, you made that into calendars, right? And then eventually you made it into a book. And yes. that book got me through a very difficult time, um, which I think I tweeted about mm. that every day I would read a page from it and just be so inspired by it. It's a huge book. It's very heavy. And there will be links to all of Lenny's work on this episode page at speakingofyoung.com. And is the book still in print? Can people still purchase this? It's not available on Amazon, but there is a link to it on your website. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's still available. Uh, and so the, the website is the best way to, to, uh, to purchase to purchase that to purchase Thank the book so yeah i'll have a link to it and i'm holding it right now it's very large it's sort of a coffee table book and you are not only a brilliant photographer but you're a beautiful writer and each page has a photo on one side and then 
your words on the other. So would you tell the listeners a little bit about the photos that make up your Healing Hands series? Oh, absolutely. And thank you so much for the kind words. And I'm humbled that I can uh, have a, an effect on you and, and others in, in, in such a beautiful way. Uh, the, the Healing Hands started uh, as a result of a trip to Senegal, West Africa in 1995 for a week-long healing ceremony uh, that we were witnessing and participating in to some degree. And uh, unknowingly, I was drawn to the hands of uh, a few of the healers and people in this particular community. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't realize uh, the impact that they will have until after I returned to Taos and I, I had maybe 40 images that I thought from, from the... Uh, 400 pictures that I took, I think there were about 40 images that were I felt were really strong. And out of that 40, about seven or eight were uh, images of hands, okay. uh, these various healers. And they had the most profound effect on me and to those that I shared the images with. Um, five years, and I started doing a, a few slideshows uh, about the trip to Senegal. Uh, I was tricked into doing a really large slideshow presentation, which kind of my roommate kind of outed me as a photographer. <laughs> I just claim my I, I used to say that I'm a guy that likes taking pictures, and uh, okay. once I did that major major slideshow presentation, mm -hmm. I had enough confidence to to claim myself as being a photographer, and decided to pursue photography as a profession. Okay. Uh, but those those initial Healing Hands images, the seven or eight, were in that body of work. Uh, and I, I didn't write about that until five years later, uh, in the middle of the night, the stories from that trip to Africa. Uh, I've, I've put together a book of that. It's called Reflections of Spirit. I have yet to publish it. Uh, I thought I would publish it before the Healing Hands, but... It didn't happen that way. Anyway, these stories uh, for each image started coming in the middle of the night, and I would get up and write. And I saw there was something at work there, something bigger, something more powerful uh, than I that wanted to reveal itself. And uh, I worked on the Healing Hands book for maybe a couple of years. Uh, and and sharing the work. One thing that the gallery does to me is it's like a, a laboratory because I can put up work and I can study how people react mm. and how they study the images mm -hmm. and how how they feel about looking at the work or, or what it does to them when, when they're looking at the work. Mm -hmm. uh, so I did that for years actually and knew that something was was powerful at, at work. And so I, I started concentrating on gathering and, you know, a number of years had passed and I, you know, I photographed all sorts of ceremonies, uh, some native gatherings, some Buddhist gatherings, uh, weddings, bar mitzvahs, uh, first, holy first communions. Um, and I would get these images uh, of hands that were working, hands that were praying, hands that were healing. And I started to comp compile them and uh, and started writing these little blurbs about it. The first show I did with the Healing Hands uh, was suggested that I write blurbs for them and people were as interested in the, the little blurbs as they were the images. Right. The combination of the two uh, became a, a pretty powerful. Yeah. And uh, so I worked on the book. And it took a few years to put it together. And uh, I, it, I must say, uh, it's one of the things I am most proud of. Uh, it was my first March. Uh, and uh, I 
I think one of my best collections and it's still ongoing, you know, it's 25 years now down the road, but I'm still creating that type of imagery and we'll work on volume two sometime later this year. And was this self-published? Uh, yes. Uh, because I didn't know better. <laughs> what do you mean? Well, my, my, my idea was, uh, I, I thought it was best, uh, I'm an Aries, so I like to control things. Okay. <laughs> but my idea, uh, I thought it was best to self-publish because I had control over everything. Right. I didn't want to take another year or two years uh, trying to seek out a publisher uh, mm -hmm. to do that work. Mm -hmm. and I, too, wanted to, to the profits from the books, the majority of the profit not just getting a small percentage. Right. Uh, so I found a publisher in New Mexico. The editor uh, for the book lived in Taos. The book designer lived in Taos. So everything was kind of in-house. Mm -hmm. And the printer was in Albuquerque. Uh, so it was kind of like a homegrown project. Uh, and it, it, it requires a lot of work, but yeah. I think the benefits uh, kind of match that effort. One of the most powerful images for me, uh, I remember when you were working on the book, and you were, you published it when you were at your Kit Carson location, right? Yes. Yeah. I remember a photo because we are we keep you and I keep in touch on Facebook. And um, I highly encourage everybody to, if you're on Facebook to either friend <laughs> or follow Lenny, because he posts photos pretty much every day. And they are, that's the first thing I see when I open Facebook, I have you set to see first. So uh. I see I see your photos first. But one of the most powerful images for me was when you were working on the book, and you had, you know, told everybody that you were and you were sitting, I think, on that bench. Uh, and there's a great selfie of us on the bench together, which oh, I'll, yes, yes. <laughs> I'll include that uh, in the slideshow when I put this on YouTube. But um, it's a photo of you holding the, I don't know if it was a galley copy or the yeah, proofs, yeah, proofs. The proofs proof. of the book. And it wasn't bound. It was kind of, there was a, a ring holding the pages together. And your hand is on the page of one of my favorite photos of a, was it a tribal elder? I'm not sure, but he's wearing a necklace that has a seahorse on it. Mm -hmm. And do you yeah, remember that, that photo? The spirit, the spirit man image. That is one of the most powerful images I've seen, but to see a photo of your hand on that photo and that that's I've saved that that's one of my favorite photos ever so Mine as well. yours as well well I just want to say for a and don't please don't hate me for saying this listeners but a lot of self-published books the quality just isn't there this book is gorgeous it's beautiful it is so well done and so I highly encourage everybody to get a copy while you still can. And then about, was it two years later, three years later, you published your second book about your time in Taos and you knew you were going to be leaving Taos, right? That you spent 23 years there and you put together a volume called Enchanted Land, a Taos 20 year retrospective filled with your best or your favorite photos that you took in Taos? Yes. Well, you know, whenever you accomplish something, of course, it gives you more confidence to to do it again. Right. And uh, as the case with, you know, the publishing the Healing Hands uh, book, uh, I, I just have to say that um, one of the most powerful things that has happened in my creative life is when the uh, DHL delivery truck backed up to my side door of the gallery on Kit Carson and they unloaded two pallets of books. Mm -hmm. uh, I forget what it was, some crazy number like 
thirteen hundred pounds. <laughs> but they brought the pal they brought the two pallets in, and when they set them on the floor and they they hit the floor hard, it, I sensed and felt as though my creative life had changed. And and what I I learned from that was that, you know, it's no easy task putting together a book of that size. I mean, it has 80 images uh, and it's the stories. Um, and just like any long-term project or relationship, there's ins and outs to that. You're in it, you're not in it, you're excited about it, you're over it, uh, you can't wait to get it done, you wish it were done. Uh, you don't think it's going to get done. All of that uh, goes into the the process of, yeah. of creating uh, a, a project. But when when those two pallets hit the ground, it was a confirmation that anything is possible. It's just a piece, a step at a time, uh, and that gave me the confidence, as I said, to, uh, you know, three years later uh, to start working on that 20-year retrospective. And when I started working on the retrospective, I didn't have a plan to leave Taos. But I knew at some point, no, I knew at some point that would happen. Mm -hmm. And whether consciously or unconsciously, I started shooting like I was going to leave Taos. I wanted, I wanted the memory as yeah. best I could, the mm-hmm. memory and the feeling of Taos. I wanted to be the one to take that with me and also to like the, the great artists, Taos artists of the past. I wanted to leave something substantial, uh, in the form of a book. Uh, to me, it's like a long love letter, uh, to Taos. I think I neglected to ask you to maybe some of the listeners, I'm sure, are not familiar with Taos. So I think we need to describe it a little bit, which I wish we had done at the beginning of the episode. I'm sorry that I didn't make that clear. So Taos is a small town located in northern New Mexico. It is a, a state in the United States, there's this running joke that some people think it's the, <laughs> the country of Mexico, right? No, it is the state. They speak English. <laughs> they speak English. Yes, it is the United States. I always say that it's two stops above Albuquerque. So how I used to get there, or how I still do get there, I haven't been there in a few years now, is fly into Albuquerque, drive north, a little over an hour to Santa Fe, stop and have lunch, Mm -hmm. because you got to acclimate to the high altitude. Mm -hmm. Taos is at about 7,000 feet above sea level. I think Denver's only about 5,000 feet. So then drive another about an hour and a half or so north of Santa Fe Mm -hmm. to Taos. And it is a gorgeous drive. Uh, Gorgeous doesn't even begin to describe how beautiful it is. It's a difficult drive. And I don't know what the population is today. Do you know what it's around? I, I don't. I would estimate, you know, 8,500, 9,000, mm-hmm. something like that. And it is, first of all, I don't want to neglect to mention that it has a very large Native American population because that is their land and we kind of moved in and it became an artist colony in the early Mm -hmm. 1900s right Mm -hmm. yes so there is a lot of art in taos a lot of art galleries and i think that the the landscape inspires the art and would you say a little bit about taos and what you um, kind of cover in that book? Um, well, the, there is no place like Taos, mm-hmm. let me say. Mm-hmm. Uh, I certainly had no design on moving to, going from the D.C. area to a town of, at the time, it was probably 7,500 people. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I'm sure the black population there is maybe 0.02 
Uh, right. <laughs> but uh, what I had found there uh, in that, uh, I call it a multicultural community. Yes. Even though some call it a tricultural, uh, not recognizing uh, more than the three cultures. Um, I found it to be a wonderful place and an inspiring place. I mean, there are more artists there per capita than probably any city in the country, mm -hmm. uh, at least one of the top three. Uh, there's the, that wide expanse of sky. It was that crystal clear sky so blue that it it hurts. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and this is right, right at the foot of the Sangre de Cristo Mountains, you know, the uh, it was a resort town, a ski resort town. So the ski valley is, you know, a, a 20, 30, 20, 30 minute drive up the mountain. Um, the, what intrigued me most was the, the big art community, you know, being around like minded folks. Uh, and, uh, with, and, and getting to know families that have been there for seven, eight, generations, both in the Hispanic families and the Native American families, mm -hmm. the sense of culture and pride and heritage and tradition is really strong there, which I, I certainly resonated with. Um, and, you know, it's tucked away in this little valley. Uh, when you see towers from above, you know, it's like, oh, it's a speck right. between the mountains and the, and the Rio Grande Gorge. Uh, when I first moved there, it was even a smaller speck, mm -hmm. and the footprint wasn't as as large as it is now. Uh, but it, it's it's quite a place. Uh, so, and Ta Taos um, in inspired me and encouraged me to become an artist uh, because of being that environment. It, it certainly fosters that uh, you know creative spark, that creative growth, and enthusiasm and, and that certainly worked for me and many others mm -hmm. and it is a town of many different arts um, the food there is outstanding absolutely outstanding um, fresh and creative and actually i found to be a big part of taos do you miss the food i, I miss the food oh i certainly do i certainly do i see the facebook post and i just drool Long for a meal here and there, and I had found the town is unique in that I, I think there are masters in every medium, yeah, and every profession. That's a great point. Uh, mm -hmm. And people come from all over. I mean, there are people that are born and raised there and been there most of their lives, and people that come at different points in their lives and want to reinvent themselves. Mm -hmm. And Taos it helps you to do that. Some people go there to hide out too, and Taos is okay for that as well. Yep. Uh, but there, there are people that uh, uh, accomplish folks in, in, in many walks that, uh, of life that move to Taos and continue their work or find new work or new ways to express themselves and new ways to make a living. And so whether that's, they're great chefs and, and cooks in Taos. There's, there's wonderful artisans of all types in Taos. There's mm -hmm. great writers, uh, storytellers, craftspeople, um, you name it. Tell us a little bit about the photos that are in the Taos retrospective book before we move on to your time in St. Augustine. Okay, great. Um, I, what I wanted to do is to chronicle my time in Taos from um, one of the first images that I took, I think it's a, a three white draft horses mm -hmm. around a, a red feeding trough. Uh, I think that was one of the first images I took when I was on vacation. Uh, from that to one of the last images that I took, uh, it probably know at the Pueblo or the, the, the welcome goodbye tree just outside of town. And everything in between, uh, I wanted to to include images that were, I feel as though were some of my absolute best. And also there's a handful that are most meaningful to me. Uh, 
and I think I have uh, 120 in the book. I in the book, the, okay. 100, yeah, 150 or so. Uh, and uh, with the Enchanted Land book and also the Healing Hands book, and uh, the quality of those two books uh, are due in part to uh, uh, Liz and Jack at uh, Fine Art New Mexico, mm-hmm. who for 15 years or more uh, have done the post-production work and printing of, of my work. I mean, they're, they're master, uh, masters in their own right. Uh, the, the printing is, is uh, I mean, Jack, I think he started the digital printing uh, when digital printing first started. So he, he's been at this now probably 30 plus years. Mm-hmm. If it wasn't for Jack and Liz at uh, Fine Art New Mexico and their uh, doing the editing and post-production work, uh, it wasn't fight for Diana Rico who edited both books and Kelly Pashok, uh, the book designer, she developed, she, uh, designed both books. If it wasn't for them, uh, neither book would be, uh, as fine as it is. Mm-hmm. And, and my, my goal, uh, in, in creating this last book is I wanted to create a masterpiece in a way by using all of our talents and my, 20 plus years of experiences in Taos. Uh, I, I wanted to present Taos in the best way that I mm-hmm. could. And yeah. I wanted people to see and feel what I have seen and felt over the last 20 years. Yes. If, if, if the quality of the book does that, then, you know, I feel that we've, we've done our job. It certainly does do that. And again, there will be a link to the book, Enchanted Land, a Taos 20-Year Retrospective, on this episode page at speakingofyoung.com, or you can go directly to Lenny's website, lennyfoster.com. And just one more thing about Taos before we move on to St. Augustine. I am, I'm going to pick it, pick it up here. You spent your last days in Taos uh, was it was the winter of 2016 at the historic Mabel Dodge Lewin House, and where actually Jung is rumored to have stayed when he visited mm-hmm. Taos Pueblo, but there's mm-hmm. some there's some controversy over whether or not he stayed there. So they say he didn't. There's some sources online that said he did. Anyway, it is. Right. Okay. Um, it was the home of Mabel Dodge the New York socialite who married a Taos Pueblo Native American man named Tony Lujan. And it is now a retreat center, kind of a hotel. And I've stayed there several times. It's very Mm -hmm. rustic and just this very authentic old adobe compound, really. And um, the last time, I think... um, I think it was the last time I was in Taos, or maybe I was I was there one other time. I didn't want to go back to Taos without you being there. It just wouldn't be the same. But oh, I was you. there for Christmas in 2016, and you and I were having lunch with some other friends. I think we were at Doc Martin's at the Taos Inn. And mm-hmm. after yeah. lunch, yeah, you said, let's head over to Mabel Dodge Lewin House, and I'll take some photos of you. And... I have to say that's one of the highlights of my life. I mean, it was like, it was so thrilling for me that you would want to photograph me. And I was wearing this really cool macage coat and was there was snow on the ground, very cold out. And <laughs> you had me hold a wooden prayer wheel, a Tibetan Buddhist prayer wheel that was, was made for Lama Zopa. Um, and the the one of the photos you took of me is actually in this book called Winter Retreat at Mabel's. Um, I don't think it's for sale. Uh, I have a copy here, and it's it's very emotional for me. This this book is beautiful. Um, would you tell us a little bit? I'll stop talking. Would you tell us a little bit about why you put this together and what it is? First off, let me say uh, that my first encounter with Yon came from a therapist uh, 
uh, young Indian therapist, Cedrus Monte, oh, who right. was in Taos, and she showed the documentary, uh, you know, and it, it had clips of him being in Africa, him being in New Mexico, mm-hmm. and that little docu- documentary um, was very instrumental in helping me to to be more purposeful and also to chill out a bit about my work and wondering if it was if it was good, if it was worth anything, if people would want it. Uh, because what in that documentary, what I can remember was that uh, like in in Roman times there were messengers that would run great distances mm. to deliver messages on a scroll. And that was their job, to be a messenger. And what I got from that was uh, what what my job was also is to be a messenger with the camera and the scroll. It didn't matter if I saw great value in it or people saw great value in it. Mm-hmm. It was my mission yeah. to document and to share what what spirit wanted me to see and share. And that it was nothing new. I wasn't doing anything new. Maybe it was more of remembering something from a past life and bringing that into the present moment through the use of the, the camera. Uh, so that documentary helped take some of my angst away and fear about what I was doing, if it was worth it, if the work was worth it. Uh, it just allowed me to ra- relax a little bit and just try to fulfill my mission in a beautiful way. Mm-hmm. Uh, and a great way to end uh, my time in Taos was uh, the gift of being able to stay at Mabel Dodge for three weeks or so before I moved. It helped me to just reflect on that last 20 years uh, and also to get back to just the sweetness of the moment, just the mm-hmm. sweetness of being on the land, yeah. being underneath the, the, the canopy of stars at night, underneath the full moon, uh, walking on that fresh calf deep snow uh, behind Mabel's uh, and I could just sit and uh, meditate on that. I could write poems at night. I could walk around after that huge breakfast yeah. uh, in the morning mm-hmm. uh, and walk out and, and snap some images of the, the grounds and the building. It was one of the first places that, uh, at the movie house that I loved going. Walk around the Mabel Dodge. We say, uh, let me just jump in here. We say that because it is actually technically a bed and breakfast. So they do serve you a huge, beautiful breakfast in their dining room where everybody gathers in the morning. Uh, yeah, so that, that last month there was uh, what a beautiful way to end uh, that Taos experience. Mm-hmm. I, I got to, as I said, write a few poems at night. Uh, get out in the morning or afternoon and shoot some pictures. And of course, you know, in, in uh, December, it's cold and there's a lot of snow. Mm-hmm. There was a beautiful, that last winter was beautiful. Yeah. So I decided to, to uh, again, leave a little gift for Mabel's and to create a little gift for myself of remembering that time. So I put together that little blurb book. Uh, it's kind of print on demand. Uh, so soon, uh, fairly soon, I'll order some copies. To, okay. To add to stock. Uh, it's not something I normally carry, uh, but uh, that was the purpose of that little book. And of course, that um, getting together with you uh, and photographing you there uh, was just a, a sweet way to end that uh, Mabel experience and the Taos experience. So that was just such a deeply spiritual, meaningful uh, time for me to spend with you that afternoon. It was nothing planned. Um, My hair wasn't even brushed, but that's Taos. That that's what I love about (laughs) Taos, right? 
Uh, is our clothes are dirty and our hair isn't brushed and there's just this naturalness and this beauty just to everything there and um i treasure it always those were your last days in taos before you relocated to saint augustine florida and we're still connected because i have a lot of family in that area and would you tell us about your decision to relocate? And I would like to get into the history of St. Augustine with you, um, something that you discovered and not many people know about. I certainly didn't know about it. Well, um, as with going to Taos on vacation and not planning to move, uh, I did the same here for St. Augustine. Uh, uh, my parents were living 30 minutes north of here, uh, south of here, and I came for my dad's 85th birthday and knew of a friend uh, that was somewhere in the area, uh, exactly a friend of a mutual friend of ours from Oklahoma. And I contacted her and realized she was just 30 minutes away, so I came to visit St. Augustine for the mm -hmm. day at lunch, and she took me on a three-hour tour. Uh, and after that, and you know, after seeing my folks and seeing the, ooh, the big minutes from the beach and seeing the old historic town, uh, after going back to Taos, you know, and that within a month, I thought, wow, that was interesting. Um, maybe I could do that. Uh, I knew Taos was kind of winding down, uh, but like, where do you go after Taos? Right. That's the big question. Where could you possibly go? Well, there's plenty of places to go, to tell you the truth. <laughs> okay. Uh, and you'll be okay. Yeah. Uh, but this, this happened to be one place that was close to my folks that was doable. Yeah. There are probably only small pockets in Florida for me. I think that's possible. And, uh, and just like moving to Taos has happened to seemingly quick uh fortunately you know if i had taken a year or so to think about it i probably would not have done it but when the inspiration struck and the possibilities happened uh and we came back here uh four months later or so during spring break and stayed for two weeks and did some playing on the beach and investigating neighborhoods and schools and it it really looked like it was a good possibility and mm -hmm. it happened pretty fast and let me say, leaving Taos in that U-Haul in middle of January, trying to get out of town before the incoming snowstorm with the trailer, the U-Haul truck full, the car on the back. Oh. Leaving, leaving Taos, uh, was like, I felt like one of the Apollo astronauts, right? Trying to break Earth's gravity. You know, sitting in that cab of the truck, I mean, both physically and emotionally, trying to break the gravity of Taos. You know, the truck is rattling down the road, and I'm shaking, and, and I'm nervous because I'm trying to get south before the storm hits. And I stop at the welcome tree or the goodbye tree to say my goodbyes to Taos and take a couple pictures. But leaving, leaving like that, breaking the bounds of Taos, is no easy task. I knew it was necessary, and I wasn't regretting that, nor do I now, mm -hmm. but it was not an easy thing to do. Mm, I'm sure. Uh, but as with the great things that have happened in my life, uh, they don't have to be easy. You know, they don't, you don't have to go with this great courage and strength. And it's like you can go in any condition that you're in, you know, as long as you're moving forward. Yeah. And I knew it was the right thing. Uh, my parents were most important. Having quality time with them in their late years uh, was important. Uh, and, and the great reward of being close to the ocean, that was important. Uh, and also uh, just developing a new sense, a creative uh, talent was also important to fresh, freshness, fresh eyes. And so... Uh, coming here, I knew next to nothing about St. Augustine, but it felt as though it would be a good thing. So we did that. And I knew nothing of 
the history of St. Augustine. Mm -hmm. I knew it was the oldest city, uh, European settlement in the country. Uh, But other than that, I knew next to nothing. Yeah, it was uh, settled by the Europeans in the 1500s. I was really surprised Mm -hmm. to read that. Fifteen, yeah, fifteen sixty-five. Mm-hmm. Um, so you, as we, you know, we didn't. I didn't mention all of the photography series that you did when you were in Taos. You have a sunflower series and horses, angel wings. I actually during um, I've had a couple of private photo shoots with you, and at the end of one of them, you have these. You took these feather this feather <laughs> these feathered wings out of the back seat of your car and had me kind of strap them on and photographed me in these wings and maybe I'll add one or two in the YouTube slideshow um so you've had lots of series and since you've been in St. Augustine you started one called Where We Stand and it is so emotionally moving and it ties into the African American history that you discovered about St. Augustine. So, would you tell us about that? Oh, sure. Thank you for, for asking. Um, I, first off, let me say that the way grace works in my life, mm-hmm. where uh, I live within minutes of uh, a place called Fort Mose, it was a black, it was the first settlement for free blacks in the country. Uh, it was the, probably the land that the first Africans set foot on American soil. Uh, and this was maybe 50, 60 years before Jamestown. Mm. Uh, so I'm like a bike ride away from this historic mm-hmm. place. And I, I knew nothing of that place. I knew nothing of uh, the African American experience here, uh, from the time slaves were sold in the town square, it was the oldest town square in the country, uh, and it was known at one point as the slave market. Uh, it's known in some circles as a slave market. Uh, uh, as far as the tourist trade is concerned, is considered the market. Uh, we don't necessarily okay. talk about. Right. Uh, but anyway, I, I landed in St. Augustine and for a brief period. I'm living in a few blocks from the gallery in an area called Lincolnville, uh, which is the first uh, community for uh, emancipated slaves uh, in the country. Uh, and you didn't know that when you got there? No, no. 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 I just happened to find an apartment in, in uh, uh, MLK Drive, which we'll get to uh, mm-hmm. in Lincolnville. And in the evenings, I'm riding my bike around, and there's uh, flats out in front of s- several homes in that area. Uh, they're part of the uh, Accord Civil Rights Museum, their Freedom Trail. So they're historic houses where civil rights leaders, activists uh, lived and where they housed activists coming from uh, different parts of the country, where uh, Martin Luther King Jr. had come and spoke on a few occasions at the St. Paul's AME Church and the First Baptist Church there in uh, Lincolnville, where Jackie Robinson had come during the civil rights movement to speak. When Andrew Young had been on a number of occasions, uh, were prominent uh, entertainers uh, and other sports figures would come and to help support the civil rights movement. I knew nothing of this uh, before coming to St. Augustine, and I was, I was, again feeling as though I was put in the right place at the right time. Yeah, my job was to just be aware and to do something with it. So I don't know how it came to came to me, but I thought, uh, and I, I started to discover that 
uh, that history in Lincolnville, the African American experience here, the civil rights movement here, is not known to a lot of people, mm-hmm. uh, both in town and, of course, you know, throughout the country. Mm-hmm. So, and I thought I would just educate myself by riding around, uh, looking at these different Freedom Trail markers, doing my own little personal research, and to help myself uh, remember and to make that information uh, and that history more accessible, I thought I would just take shoes uh, and place them in these historical places uh, or use the shoes to represent historical people, such as Dr. King and Andrew Young and Dr. Haley, who was a, a dentist here and uh, a civil rights activist. Uh, and the, the women who were also involved in the civil rights movement and also housed uh, different people that would come for the cause. Uh, so I started riding around and placing shoes in these historical places and taking pictures and then writing a, a brief narrative. Uh, and so now we're up to, uh, it, it, the first one started as uh, a slave's feet on the slave market bricks in the town square and I used uh, this guy, this street guy, paid him to hold us uh, using his feet and the slave chain uh, from West Africa that my sister had purchased there. And that was the first thing was that I used the a street person's feet and these slave chains from West Africa to represent the to represent the slave trade, the slave market. To uh, to to uh, one of the the last images I took on, at that sla- same slave market uh, uh, bricks was the shoes to represent Andrew Gillum, who was the first African American to run for uh, the governorship of Florida. He did a stump speech there uh, a couple of winters ago. He did win, of course, but. Uh, I wanted to document that historical event. Mm-hmm. So there, there are many things from the one of the first lunch counter sit-ins at World War downtown. Uh, shoes in front of the stools there to the Munson Motor Lodge, where uh, the owner uh, joined the civil rights movement and protests. Uh, there were activists coming from all over. They were swimming in the Munson Motor Lodge pool, both black and white. Uh, I think the guests were white. I mean, the the motel guests were white, mm-hmm. were white, and friends of theirs were African-American, who they invited in to the pool to swim. The owner, he of course, didn't care for that at all, poured acid into the pool oh. to help face them out. Uh, at that mm-hmm. same Munson Motor Lodge is where Dr. King asked one of his rabbi friends to to bring 16 rabbis to uh, St. Augustine in the summer of 64 to help protest segregation and the mistreatment of African Americans. Uh, they they went to the Munch and Molais and prayed uh, in a group and were arrested. Uh, there was, I, I placed 16 shoes on the pavement there and photographed them from above to represent that story. There also with Bill King and Dr. Ralph Abernathy and a local activist were arrested uh, upon trying to enter the segregated restaurant at the Motor mm-hmm. Lodge. Um, I placed sandals and hats and glasses at the beach uh, was where one of the first attempts to integrate a white beach took place. And of course, those participants, uh, just like any of that, protest, uh, mistreatment and segregation. I mean, they were, they were beat almost, some of them almost beat to death, uh, by, by supremacists and, and people that were against, uh, integration. Uh, so I'm finding out these stories. And so as I, as I do research on one story, I hear about another, I create the image that leads to another story, to another story. So now there's probably 24 images in that series, and it's ongoing. Uh, I tried to to uh, win a Guggenheim grant these last two years, and that didn't happen. But 
I'm still inspired to continue uh, the stories to help uh, make the history of St. Augustine known to a wider audience. What what is the Guggenheim grant? Is there anything we can help with with that? No, that uh, you apply in September, and they have a committee which reviews the submissions. Uh, I think there's probably two to three thousand people apply, mm. and they give 169 uh, grants. And that didn't happen this year. I, I made it a couple of stages into the into the for judging, for like right. uh, but it wasn't uh, awarded a grant. Uh, but And that's for this Where We Stand series? That's for the Where We Stand series, yeah. So now, is this, are all of these images on display in your gallery? No. Uh, the Guggenheim, in fact, still has the images because of the uh, pandemic. They had, you know, had to shut down their offices, so they have yet to send them back. Okay. I have maybe... 18 or so represented on my website, the Gallery 144 website. Okay. Uh, the stories the stories aren't there, but the images are, and the titles are there. And I think I'll continue this year in creating imagery. I have another uh, eight that haven't been worked up. I have another five or six in my head that I have yet to create. So we'll see what happens at the end of the year. I'm sure at some point, I mean, my idea is to have it as a traveling exhibition to to uh, universities. Oh, wonderful! University museums here in the state of Florida. Uh, uh, that's where I'll I'll begin with that. Maybe we'll apply again near the end of the year for a Guggenheim. I, just I hope so. Where I am, but you know, sometimes uh, that uh, I was inspired by the Guggenheim to work feverishly on the series mm -hmm. so uh you know if a guggenheim happens great if it doesn't that was the the motivation for me to to get it going and and, and once you get something going sometimes the energy momentum or purpose yes. of a work will carry you through uh no matter the, you know, the end result the decision to use shoes is brilliant the the photos that I've seen that are on your website, and I'll provide a link to that as well, and hopefully include some in the YouTube slideshow to go along with this episode. They are very, very moving, and they're brilliantly done. Maybe they would make a great book as well. But yes, a traveling exhibit uh, would reach a lot of people. And this needs to be discussed and talked about and brought out into the open, which leads me to the time we're in right now. I don't know how to speak about it, so I would like you to speak about it. And I find it very interesting that you were my guest this week. This was planned a couple months ago. And you've, when I started this podcast in 2015, well, I should say before I started it, I've always wanted to do a podcast and it took a couple years to get it going. I didn't know that it would be, speaking of Jung is interviews with Jungian analysts. And I only interview Jungian analysts and I wasn't sure that I was going to do it that way in the beginning. Um, so I kept these running lists of people that I wanted to interview and you were always at the top of the list. So we're going back to <laughs> like right, 2013 or so I had you on a list. So the fact that you are my guest this week, when there is all of this racial tension, in the United States going on that is breaking our hearts. Mm. I, I don't know how to speak about it. I would love it if you would tell us, the audience, the listeners, what your experience has been. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, I have to say I'm so proud of what you've done these last couple of years with the podcast. And I, uh, I may not be in contact often, but I cheer you on. Thank you. I know you do appreciate that. Uh, the, and I have to say the, 
the where we stand series, I think the timing with that part of, I think why I started with that too, was right around the time that Colin Kaepernick was uh, decided to kneel yes. in protest of the treatment of African Americans uh, by the, uh, some police forces in the country. Uh, uh, and he was, he was catching so much flack for that. And mm -hmm. the purpose of that was kind of misconstrued or, or, and some media outlets or some parties, uh, saw it as, uh, disrespecting the United States, or disrespecting right. the flag, the anthem, uh, when it was, it was a silent. And we see now the power and beauty and, and his foresight in that was, uh, was that, that was a peaceful protest. That was to bring awareness to what is, what is going on. Uh, I think there were probably, there were many people in denial of what was really happening or disbelief or, or, uh, didn't see it as, a, uh, a serious issue. Right. And of course now, uh, as time has gone on and more cameras are available and, and more media outlets are available, we see the seriousness of that. Mm -hmm. So I started the where we stand series as to say, uh, this is where we have stood. I mean, the reason why we're kneeling is because this is where we have stood. These are the things that have happened. Mm -hmm. And I'm just speaking of just in this little town, which, you know, the summer of 64 was known as the most violent place in America because of the, uh, uh, the initial meetings and plannings and protests uh, for the civil rights movement. I mean, this was one of the birthplaces of that and things that happened here, the protests that happened here garnered national attention. And because of that, there was national outcry. And because of that, the, the civil rights uh, bill was, was uh, uh, waiting to be voted on. And because of the political, because of the national pressure and the national media uh, lawmakers uh, decided that, um, uh, Maybe this is something that we should do and pass the Civil Rights Act. Uh, so what the, pro the various protests that took place here, and mostly by young people, uh, which is happening now, uh, um, helped to bring about a major change in the country. Uh, and it wasn't easy, it wasn't pretty, and there's still um, a lot to deal with. I mean, obviously, you know, you... The, the methods have changed, the uniforms have changed, uh, but uh, uh, the heinous acts still continue. Uh, and we probably only know, of course, we just know a handful uh, in the last five or six years, we only know a, of a handful of these incidents, but right. they have gone on for the last hundred years. Right. Whether, whether it's by the end of a rope or by underneath uh, an abuser's knee. Yeah. And, uh, being here in St. Augustine, uh, and being close to, uh, historic plaza and, uh, close to Martin Luther King, uh, Jr. Uh, Avenue where historical gatherings took place, uh, and planning, strategic planning took place by the NAACP and the Southern Christian Leadership Council. I mean, this, this, this is fertile ground for, uh, the movement that's going on now and future movements. And, and just recently with the, uh, with the killing of George Floyd, uh, people all over the country are now, some are now becoming aware of how prevalent and how serious and how heinous these acts are and are speaking out. And as I said, fortunately, the young people are saying, no, this is, this is no way we're going to stand for this. And they're speaking out They're They're gathering and they're organizing and, and getting together with elders and, and, and multicultural uh, 
protests and marches mm -hmm. and vigils are taking place, uh, uh, all necessary to bring about awareness and hopefully that will bring about some change. And so I've been, uh, again, fortunate to be put in the right place at the right time where my gallery is right in, in this area where some of these local actions are taking place. Mm -hmm. And one most recently, two days ago, yeah. I mean, the police station is right across the street. So there was a, uh, there were two rallies, uh, um, one, two, uh, two evenings ago and one three evenings ago and the one across the street uh, there was a march up king street and a rally in front of the police station uh and to witness this and to, to hear the impassioned speech from the local uh minister mm -hmm. reverend rawls uh it was in fact a way a history lesson because he spoke to what has happened since he's been here trying to bring about change, trying to um, help integrate uh, city offices, uh, uh, county offices, uh, the police departments, and and what African Americans are up against in that regard, and and, and social services and, vote, and voting, how in many areas the, the, the African American minority communities are marginalized. Uh, so in, in, in listening to Reverend Rawls, I mean, as I said, it, it's for me, it's like a history lesson. It said, OK, this happened, this happened, this happened and this happened. And this is and these things are happening now. How much has changed? Uh, and change doesn't occur unless people are pressed to change. Uh, so the movement is about that. And to be here at this place at this time, it is the South. It was known as one of the most racist cities and racist counties in America. Some think it still is. I don't know that. Uh, I just know in my conversations with people that have been around here, uh, you know, uh, people of my age, I hear stories of what it, it was like and, mm -hmm. and what they have to deal with. Uh, so my, again, I, I, I'm, I'm pulled into, uh, documenting that in my way okay or, or or at least being out there so i can get imagery that shows yeah. what's what's going on and that's doing my part one thing i have, I have learned in this in this recent like the pandemic you know the street people uh who don't have the resources that we have they don't even have a they can't worry about being quarantined they don't have a home uh so one thing I have learned in this in this recent two months is that uh, I don't necessarily have to do great things. I don't have to necessarily do things that affect a wide number of people. Uh, I don't have to post every kind act that I do. It's not a, necessarily a photo op. I I can just use my resources however humble they are to just be of service to help someone. And that's what I try to show in my work and, and what I post on Instagram and Facebook. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm in business too, so I need to sell stuff, but mm -hmm. I'm trying to bring about, uh, you know, my parents have a saying, uh, use your blessing to be a blessing to, to be a blessing to others. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's my accessibility and my visibility and my ability yeah. <laughs> to help bring about awareness and change. You've certainly taught me a lot over the past few days just by visiting your Facebook page because you were at the march and you were at the rally and the protest. It takes bravery to speak out about these issues, and I I don't want to speak about them. I'm in no position to speak about them. So I thank you for having the courage to come on here and talk about it. And anything you want to say, anything else you would like to add, please, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, dear. I, I, I can't speak for 
anyone else. Uh, but I can just speak to what I have ex- what I have seen. And fortunately for me, I haven't experienced uh, the trauma that many African American men have. Uh, you know, being out and about. Uh, you don't even have to be out and about today. You could be in your own house. You could be in your own uh, yard, your neighborhood, your car. Uh, you know, there are bad actors out there in, in uniform and out. Uh, and what is the, what is coming to light now, I think too, and especially like these last 24, 48 hours that, you know, that the, typically the people that are peaceful protesting aren't the same ones that are looting. Right. There's a, there's a, there's a, and we're, we're in some outlets may be led to believe that's not the case, that there's, there's this group and they're doing uh, both. But uh, in the reports in the last couple of days that I've listened to, uh, they're known that people that are coming from outside to purposely uh, come in and, and loot uh, after uh, the protests, the peaceful protests are done, like after curfew, uh, where that element is encouraged by and paid to do what they're doing. I, I don't. I, I I can't speak to where, uh, who's responsible for that. I just know there's a difference uh, from the protesters and the looters and violent offenders. I don't believe they're they're one and the same. And a little research of buried news sources will prove that to be true. Uh, and, you know, protest change doesn't come about by just calm and peaceful approach. I mean, uh, sometimes, you know, it takes uh, um, well, I can't say drastic measures to, to make people become aware, but uh, at least in terms of drastic drastic numbers and persistent and not in a quiet, meek and mild manner way. Not to say that uh, the way to get people's attention is to burn things and burn buildings and lob. And, uh, I don't certainly believe that's the way. Mm-hmm. But uh, people's, uh, yeah, you, you're dealing with uh, generations or decades or generations of pent up anger and frustration right. yes. and uh, uh, being victimized. Uh, so, I mean, to say, well, to say, well, you should just protest peacefully. Uh, and calmly, well, when people have been victimized, uh, the, the response is typically not that bad. Yeah, that's a great point, that there is a lot of history there, a lot of charged emotion. And so I, I don't know what the answer is. Um, yeah, you can't just have a calm, peaceful, little gathering and sing songs and no, no. But like you said, there's a difference between that and throwing a brick through a window and stealing Chanel purses or whatever they were doing. It's certainly easier in, of course, a small town uh, for the protest to be uh, peaceful. I mean, there's there's not an element of of people being brought in or bust in to create havoc or mm-hmm. chaos or to to uh, hate what's what's really going on. Uh, so in the larger cities, of course, you're dealing with thousands and thousands of people. Right. You know, that's, that's hard to control. Right. I, I like the words that you used to describe Reverend Rawls' speech. You called it impassioned and fiery. So is there anything else we haven't covered that you would like to discuss? I just have to speak a bit to moving from Taos to St. Augustine. Mm-hmm. And it's not necessarily about the, the places. It's about the process 
of what happens after that, when you leave the familiar, when you leave the known, when you leave community, when you leave your, in a way, your persona, your identity, your way that you normally operate on a day-to-day basis, the way you make a, a living or how much of a living you make. Uh, I had no idea of the level of, of the process of grieving that, of, I call it, dying these little deaths. Yes. Uh, I didn't realize how much that I was going to have to let go of. Mm-hmm. And that includes my, those are things I just mentioned, my identity. You go to a place where you, you're you not known, nothing is known about you. It's just your physical appearance. Uh, there is no like known identity. What do you do with that? I mean, to reinvent. Uh, it's, it's not easy, but it's one of the most rewarding things I think I have done. Uh, in that I get to let go of all of that, that persona, that mm-hmm. perception, that identity. I get to start over. And, uh, and one, I don't have the luxury of that and the comfort um, of being known and secure and loved and right. prosperous and, you know, identity and status, all that goes out the window. It's like, wow, there's both freedom and terror. (laughs) I was just speaking about this a couple episodes ago with Dr. Stanton Marlin. Um, They call it ego side or ego deaths. And that, that, that we undergo several of those in our life, these little ego deaths and Sometimes that needs to happen for our growth. So it's not an easy thing to do. Yeah. No, dear, it's certainly not. But I am so grateful for it. And uh, and I'm sure that's going to happen again if I'm lucky. Uh, I don't know how many great adventures that you could have in your lifetime. Probably you could count them on one hand. I'm not talking about taking a a trip to Antarctica or mm-hmm. Papua New Guinea or, you know, up mm-hmm. where you uproot and leave all of that familiar and go somewhere else for that next great adventure. I said, I don't know how many opportunities we'll have in a lifetime, but I, I, I encourage that. Uh, and even though it wasn't easy, I'm reveling in the, the rewards of that. And the beauty of that right now, uh, and I anticipate that will happen again. And uh, I, it, it's for me, it's like a near death experience because, like, I'm gone. I have to like let go of myself mm-hmm. in order to be okay here. If that mm-hmm. makes any sense to you, yes. Uh, not straddling two different worlds. Not have one foot there, one foot here, or right. attached to who I was or how I was or who I was, how I was seen. I mean, that is is just maddening if if you're clutched to that, uh, if you're clinging to that. Uh, There's great freedom and pain in letting go of what was and just being here now in the present moment and even especially so during this time of of one, the, the COVID and being... Uh, having to change the way we live and how we go about our daily lives. And on top of that, I mean, with the death of my mother, the the most, the hardest thing, the thing I fear the most in life, the hardest thing I have and experienced and how that too is uh, inviting me to, uh, live in a 
in a different way, uh, developing a different relationship to to her, one of purely spirit, not spirit and physical. The physical presence is gone, and at times it's devastating, and at times it, it too is it frees me up to that I can have contact with her at any time and seek wisdom and guidance and love and uh, but it has changed changed me in a way that's really hard to put into words that the people that experience it know yeah. uh, that you are forever different. So and what do you do with that difference? Uh, mm -hmm. how do you how do you live from here on? One is staying in the present moment. I there's, there's some comfort and safety there, you know, thinking too much about the past or uh, imagining what, how and what the future is going to look like and feel. Or it's just with the COVID and with the intense intensity of what's happening out on the streets. Uh, ooh, it's such a time. Yeah. Uh, and I am, I am one, I'm a sober guy, so I, deal with everything raw, <laughs> right. you know, there's yes. no smoke or drink or pill to kind of, to quiet the, the voices or the calm the nerves or to, to numb the feelings or put up a wall between what's happening and what I'm feeling, you know, it's just raw. So I have to use what I've been given through, um, 12 step programs and whatever spiritual practice that I can put together and what's focusing on what's right, what's loving, what's beautiful, uh, and sharing that. I mean, that helps to get me through. So, uh, you know, I, well, not that it was chosen, but I, by me, but I have a new identity <laughs> that I'm working on. You know, maybe that's a more truer one, uh, where it's one more of Spirit based and ego based or personality based. Because uh, you can't go wrong with spirit. You can't go wrong with spirit. I think those are some wise words to end on. What do you think, Lenny? Do you want to wrap it up? I believe that's good, dear. I so love you for, for what you do and what you share and allow me to be a part of. It's, uh, I, I can sense that this will also be transformational in, in one way or the other. So thank you. Please visit the website Speaking of Jung, that's J U N G dot com for more information on everything that was discussed in this episode. There you will also find all of the previous episodes of this podcast, which are available to stream or to download for free. This podcast is also available on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, TuneIn, Spotify, and iHeartRadio, and it will be available later on our YouTube channel. You can also listen to this episode on your Amazon Echo device simply by saying, Alexa, play Speaking of Jung on Apple Podcasts or TuneIn. Just be sure to pronounce Jung with a hard J. So with special thanks to my guest, Lenny Foster, this is Laura London, and you've been listening to a special quarantine edition of Speaking of Jung. <laughs>